four, four three, three, two, two one, one, zero, zero, ignition. Hello, the listener. Welcome to UniversalExports.co, where we cover everything, including motoring, walking, eating, drinking, astronomy, photography and film, science, and much, much more. Stay tuned for The Plat Du Jour. Yeah, and today we look at the Gardner's Creek bike trail. We did that, we did that with style. We're going to listen to the butcher birds that we happen to wake up to every morning at our house. You can listen to them too today, which is pretty good. The Mars Inside Lander wasn't that spectacular. We'll give you a few more details on that at solar panels and the record that it broke. And what about Brian Dawes' exhibition at the Bingham Gallery? That was superb. I've got a little more detail on that coming up. Listen now. After a five-month stay in Tangier, Morocco this year and a very successful recent exhibition, Passage, in Bungendor, Brian visited Minion, showing works conceived and inspired by Tangier and travels in southern Spain. The works explore his love of theatre, circus and dance and his fascination with the architecture of Tangier and Fez. Tangier and you were made for each other and I'd been through a number of times but like most people who go to Morocco they head through Tangier up to Fez or Marrakesh or Essaouira or wherever and never spend any time in um, Tangier and she said I think you ought to go there, you're made for each other so I thought yeah I know Fez I can spend two weeks in Tangier, that'll be good so I took off and I got there and within a week I'd fallen in love with the place and discovered what she was talking about. And then two days before I was about to leave to come back to Australia, um, I was having dinner at a, a gallery owner's uh, house in the Casbah and she'd seen the earlier work and she said, do you want to have an exhibition when you come back next year? And I went, oh yeah, why not? And she said, just make it about Tangier. And I went, OK, but I'm leaving in two days and I don't have many photographs, so it'll have to be something else. Dawes' technique is interesting and captivating. In one moment, the sensuous brushstroke work is masterful and alluring. But wait! In the next moment, you realise there are no brushstrokes. It's not quite smoke and mirrors and not quite misleading. It is just part of the battery of effects he gets from using digital apps. Yep, not even Photoshop. Look, put Photoshop aside and have a play with the apps. You know, and then you get an app and it'll cost you two dollars. I've seen effects like this used by others, and generally I've found it tends to make the work look cheap and gaudy. Dawes' subtle use with appropriate technique on the selected image, combined with his secret recipe of filters works well and the result is effective and pleasing. An exhibition worth seeing if you can get the chance. Space Dawes. Space Dawes. Space Dawes. Mars InSight. A week has just gone since NASA's InSight spacecraft settled into its sandy site on the surface of Mars. Data sent back to Earth has confirmed that not only is the lander in full working order, it has claimed a new record for power generation on the Red Planet. After a seven-month journey, InSight landed on Mars last Monday with images and data verifying the lander is in good working order. That includes relaying photos of itself and the landing site, which NASA describes as a large sandbox, and deploying the solar arrays it will use to power its scientific endeavours. InSight's batteries can only keep the lander running for a matter of hours without those solar panels, so a successful unfurling was a tad important. InSight will need all the power it can get as it pushes the scientific boundaries of what is known about Mars. The primary means of doing so involves drilling down into the planet's interior to conduct geological experiments to learn more about how Mars and bodies like the Earth and Moon formed. And the final setting for these experiments is also filling mission control with optimism, with the latest images and data revealing new details about InSight's home. The Gardner's Creek Walking and Biking Trail. The 20 kilometre off road section of the trail commences at Blackburn Road just north of Heath Street, Blackburn. It passes through the Blackburn Creeklands Reserve, 
Gardner's Creek Reserve and a local history park before crossing into the city of Monash at Highbury Road. The trail passes through beautiful wetland areas where ducks, birds and frogs can be found. You will also travel through Gardner's, Ashwood, Jingella and Holmes Glen Reserves where a number of local sports grounds are located. The trail heads out of the municipality at the Warrigal Road underpass. It continues to follow the creek and Monash Freeway City Link through the various parks and reserve until it crosses the Yarra River to meet the main Yarra Trail to the city. It does feature a drinking fountain and dog poo bag dispenser. We did the stretch from Malvern Valley Golf Course to Burke Road, passing through and by the golf course, Darling Park, Dorothy Labour Reserve, Glen Iris Park, Eric Raven Reserve, Nettleton Reserve and Kayara Park. It's so fantastic that these facilities are here so close to town. A fantastic coffee stop is at Blake's Feast Catering on Brixton Rise. It's right on the trail. We did some of the return on the western side of the parks past the East Malvern Tennis Club, but the creek side is by far the most interesting. Give it a go, walk or ride. You won't be disappointed. With its lovely lilting song, the grey butcher bird may not seem to be a particularly intimidating species. However, with its strong hooked beak and fierce stare, the grey butcher bird is not a bird to be messed with. When a nest or newly fledged chick is around, if you venture too close, a butcher bird will swoop by, flying straight at your face, sometimes striking with enough force to draw blood, and each swoop is accompanied by a loud, maniacal cackle. The adult grey butcher bird has a black crown and face and a grey back with a thin white collar. The wings are grey with large areas of white and the underparts are white. The grey and black bill is large with a small hook at the tip of the upper bill. The eye is dark brown and the legs and feet are dark grey. Both sexes are similar in plumage but the females are slightly smaller than the males. Young grey butcher birds resemble adults but have black areas replaced with olive brown and a buff wash on the white areas. The bill is completely dark grey and often lacks an obvious hook. They are sometimes mistaken for small kingfishers. Grey butcher birds range from mid-eastern Queensland through southern Australia, including Tasmania, to northern western Australia. There is an isolated population in the Kimberley and the northernmost parts of the Northern Territory. Grey butcher birds are found in a range of wooded habitats, including suburban areas. In inland areas, the birds tend to favour the denser forests. Grey butcher birds are aggressive predators. They prey on small animals, including birds, lizards and insects, as well as some fruits and seeds. Butcher birds get their names from their habit of hanging captured prey on a hook or in a tree fork or crevice. They sit on an open perch searching for prey, pouncing with great speed. Most mobile prey is caught on the ground, though small birds and insects may be caught in flight. The bird's nest is bowl-shaped and is made of sticks and twigs lined with grasses and other soft fibres. It is normally located within 10 metres of the ground. The eggs are incubated by the female and the young birds are fed by both parents. The young birds will remain in the breeding territory for about a year and help the parents raise the young of the following season. Lovely song, intimidating behaviour. And to finish with, at last, confirmation of Murphy's Law with a wonderful Irish explanation. Murphy drops some buttered toast on the kitchen floor and lo and behold... It lands a butter side up. He looks down in astonishment, for he knows it's a law of the universe that buttered toast always is buttered down. So he rushes round to the parish to fetch Father Flanagan. He tells a priest that a miracle has occurred in his kitchen. He won't say what it is, but asks Father Flanagan to come and see it with his own eyes. He leads Father Flanagan in the kitchen and asks him what he sees on the floor. Well, says the priest, it's pretty obvious. Someone has dropped some buttered toast on the floor and then for some reason they flipped it over so the butter was on top.
No, father, I dropped it and it landed like that, explained Murphy. Oh, my lord, says Father Flanagan, drop toast never falls with its butter side up. It's a miracle. But wait, it's not for me to say it's a miracle. I'll have to report this matter to the bishop, and he'll have to deal with it. He'll send some people around to interview you, take photos and all those things. A thorough investigation is conducted, not only by the archdiocese, but by scientists sent over from the courier in Rome. No expense is spared. There is great excitement in the town, as everyone knows that a miracle will bring in much-needed tourism revenue. Then, after eight long weeks, and with great fanfare, the bishop announces the final ruling. It is certain that some kind of an extraordinary event took place in Murphy's kitchen, quite outside the natural laws of the universe. Yet, the Holy See must be very cautious about ruling a miracle. All other explanations must be ruled out. Unfortunately, in this case, it has been declared no miracle because they think Murphy may have buttered the toast on the wrong side. Thank you for listening. Subscribe, call back, do whatever you need to do. But please come back again. I'd love to have your company. Signing off, universalexports.co. Bye-bye.